And usually by the time you get to your teenage years, you have a pretty good idea, maybe not of who you're going to fall for, but at least what gender. A few people are bisexual, but pretty much we identify as gay or straight. But psychologist Lisa Diamond says that in fact, most of us are a whole lot less fixed than we think. And the title of her book says it all, Sexual Fluidity, Understanding Women's Love and Desire. Welcome with me, please, Lisa Diamond. Hey, Lisa, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Although I want to correct something that you said. Okay. You said Go a right few ahead. people are bisexual, but most folks are gay or straight. That's what most of us used to think because we didn't have very good data, but now we have a number of large, random, representative surveys that have been done on people's sexual attractions, and actually bisexual patterns of attraction are far more common than exclusively gay or lesbian patterns oh, of attraction. Oh, you just cut to the chase entirely. So, so the there you go, we're done. The heterosexuals are still <laughs> winning, but it's heterosexuals first, and then the bisexuals, and then the exclusive gays and lesbians. Okay, so I'm going to back up and let's figure okay. out how you got to that point. So 20, it's 20 years ago now, right, that mm -hmm. you started doing this big survey. And you should explain this, but it was you were looking at non-heterosexual women yep. and their sexual orientation, sex lives, yeah, desire. At, at the time I started the study, it was the early 90s. Most of the research on sexual identity development in young people was done on samples of men. It was just easier to study men at that time. Because so they I, would answer the questions? But, but they, when most of the, the research was done based on going to like community centers and bars, and those settings tended to have more men than women. So we, we ended up producing a whole science of men because it was easier to find them. So when I started graduate school, I was like, well, you know, I'm a feminist, I'm, gonna, I'm a lesbian, I'm a feminist, I'm going to study women, you know. So I didn't quite know what I was looking for, but I knew I wanted to follow women over time. And what I found was that as I tracked women's sexual attractions and sexual identities over time, regardless of where they started, whether they were lesbian or bisexual or some of the women were like, well, I don't know what I am, but I'm somewhere, there was a lot of movement as time went on that some of the, the women who started out as lesbian ended up falling in love with their male best friends and getting involved with them. Some of the wiz women who were predominantly bisexual then ended up switching to be exclusively lesbian. And I just found that there was a lot more flexibility in women's sexuality than most of the literature at that time had suggested. So were you surprised? I was very surprised. And initially, I thought, well, you know, they're still young. Give them a little few more years and They'll everyone, settle down. everyone will settle down. And yet I found that the longer I followed them, the more women started to change, so that by the, by the time I reached the 10-year point, and now I'm at the 20-year point, uh, change is substantially more common than stability. That there's a relatively small subset of women who underwent no change at all. Most women have undergone some fluctuation. So how do you explain this? Because it goes against everything we're taught and everything we think. We Which think, I think is, that we're supposed to settle into a sexual identity and, oh, I'm only attracted to men or only to women. And I think that's because most of the other research tended to, to look at people at one point in time. And if you capture anyone at one point in time, they may feel pretty certain that where they are is where they are, right? And so if they're you know, heterosexual, they're like, well, I'm, I'm heterosexual, that's who I am. The, the trick comes when you let their lives unfold. And most of our lives are a lot more complex than we think. And it looks like our human species just has a lot more capacity for um, fluidity and, and for plasticity than most of us imagine. And in fact, there's, you know, it was fun to listen to the, the discussion about animals because if you look at a, at a lot of mammalian species, there are a lot of species in which one gender has a little bit more flexibility in their sexuality than the other. So Is there same-sex sexuality in animals? Exactly, yes. And yet it's never exclusive same-sex sexuality. Uh -huh. in, in every species in which you find same-sex sexuality, it's co-occurring with other sex sexuality, which is why you know, people often ask, well, how could homosexuality survive in the gene pool? Well, it's because in every single 
species you look at and in every human society that's ever been studied, you never find exclusive same-sex sexuality until mm. you get to the contemporary Western cultures post-1960, right? That's really the only time in which, which you see gay and lesbian people having the opportunity to sort of take themselves out of the reproduction market. But in every other society, uh, individuals who engage in same-sex contact have been reproducing and mating and marrying and passing on those genes. Well, I want to make sure I'm understanding you. Do you, do you mean that same-sex sexuality is a cultural construction? No, no, no. I'm saying that the way in which it expresses itself is a cultural construction. So even if you have a genetic predisposition for same-sex sexuality, and we know that there's a genetic influence on it, although it's not deterministic, um, cultures have made it so that you, even if you have that predisposition, you're going to express it, but you've got to mate anyway, right? So you might mm. only really want to engage in same-sex contact, but our contemporary human culture is the only one that's actually made it possible for gay and lesbian individuals to stop reproducing if they didn't feel like you know, getting married. In every other culture, men and women have been really successfully channeled into heterosexual pairings so that regardless of whether you wanted to have heterosexual sex, you were going to have it and you were going to make babies. Our, our species has done a pretty good job you know, of, of making sure that happens. So contemporarily, when we see individuals who identify as gay or lesbian and only have same-sex relationships, that's only been possible uh, in the past you know, 50 mm -hmm. years and only in industrialized societies. So I have to ask, was there a personal component for you of starting to do this research? I mean, you came out, what, in your college years? I came out in my college years, and there wasn't so much of a personal component. I mean, I certainly wasn't looking for sexual fluidity. I was just, a, you know, like a garden variety lesbian when I started doing this uh, <laughs> research, a good, plain, old, boring lesbian. Um, and, <laughs> and did the research inspire you to become a more interesting well, you know, experimental Well, unfortunately it has, and, 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 and sometimes I feel bad because I've been asked to speak to a lot of um, uh, bisexual organizations because I've been a big advocate for more research on bisexuality because it is just so much more common than exclusive same-sex sexuality. And often I feel a need to confess to the organizers, like, I'm actually a lesbian. I'm sorry. Like, I love, I'm, I'm like the, the greatest champion of bisexuals that you can find, but I'm not a bisexual. And they're like, it's okay, you know, we need, but, but story, we need the lesbians to stand up for us. But the story you're telling, I mean, you don't know, right? I mean, oh, exactly. You know, I should be the first person to say, like, I'm a lesbian now. Who the hell knows? But, you know. I've also been married to the same woman for 22 years, so I think she would be upset if I said I was gonna like, you know, very outside of that. I don't know, you know, the pizza delivery and guy should show up. And I met her when I was up. doing this study, and she helped recruit many of the participants. I'm like, uh, you made my career possible. So we were talking about women. What about men? Is the same thing true? Are, are men as sexually fluid as women? I used to think that women were much more fluid than men. And my thoughts on that have really started to change. I started to do more research on men, uh, and I did a study you know, in Salt Lake City, where you would think the men would be pretty rigid. Um, <laughs> and I found uh, a really surprising degree of fluidity in men's attractions as well. Uh, Gay-identified men reporting that they frequently masturbate to fantasies of women. Uh, and straight identified men saying that they, you know, had some sort of oral sex with a man in the past 12 months. So even in men, I think the boundaries aren't as rigid as they used to be. I think one of the reasons it looks like it's more common in women is that I think we give women in our culture more permission to be affectionate with other women, to have close relationships with other women that might spill over into unusual affection. And I think we have been more rigid with men that you know men have to be men, and if men are gonna have close emotional relationships, they're gonna be with women and not with other men. But some of those norms are changing, and I think men have more permission now to you know, explore intimacy in a variety of ways with both male and female friends. So I think we'll find out in like another 10, 15 years you know, how, how much fluidity differs between women and men. Maybe the culture will have caught up for men as well as women. Have you translated any of this into figures? Like if you had to guess, what percentage of the general population would be 
fluid. It is, it's, it's really, I, I get that question a lot and it's hard to know. One thing we do know is that we, because we have good nationally representative data on just the percentage of individuals who report any degree of same-sex attraction at all. And the most recent data on that um, that's random and representative, it comes from like 30,000 adults in the United States, suggests that about 14% of women and about 10% of men report some degree of same-sex attraction. And in both women and men, the vast majority of those individuals describe themselves as mostly, but not completely, heterosexual. Mm -hmm. So that the largest group of individuals walking around with same-sex attractions are individuals who you would never know had same-sex attractions. They identify as heterosexual, they think they're mainly heterosexual, but they're like heteroflexible, right? So they're the majority of individuals with same-sex attractions, and yet historically they've been completely invisible, invisible. We only now are starting to see what a big group they are. And they're not just a big group in the US. You find the same thing if you look at mm -hmm. Great Britain, France, the Netherlands, the heteroflexibles are like this huge looming population. Does this change anything about what we think about, what we know about the nature of desire, why, how we fall in love with the people we fall in love with? I think it just shows us that as, again, as a species, uh, flexibility is our, our hallmark. There are a lot of animal species in which the process of selecting a mate and going about sex is very rigidly channeled. In some species, it only happens when you're capable of reproducing. One of the things about humans with our huge brains and our huge social systems is that we go about the process of affiliation and attachment and bonding and sex in really complex social ways. And we use sexuality for purposes of affiliation and we use affiliation for the purposes of mating, that there are sort of cross currents between love and attachment and friendship and sexuality that are a lot more complicated than they are in other species because of our huge social groups and because of our huge uh, social brains. And therefore, we should expect that these are flexible processes that we can tweak in a number of ways. But I thought that the whole purpose of, in, in evolution, the purpose of sex and love really is to reproduce. And we do that very successfully. But not only do we need to reproduce, but we also need to care for our children. And some, uh, some scholars have suggested that the fact that humans often historically have relied on other adults in the social group to help care for our children makes it really, really important to have intimate, close, trusting bonds with other individuals in your social network. Some have suggested that sexual fluidity might serve that purpose. Now, I'm not sure whether the best way to get your neighbor to help care for your kids is to have sex with your <laughs> neighbor. Is to sleep with her? But, you know, <laughs> maybe. But again, the idea so is that, for babysitting. That, that our lives are complex enough so that it's not just a matter of meet, have sex, spit the kid out, but that, that we have always reproduced in a large social context in which our relations with other members of the social group are a key part of our reproductive success. Mm. One last question. We haven't talked about the politics of this, but it strikes me that there would be some interesting political implications because if you're saying that, nope, sorry, it's not just you were born that way, any of us could be that way. And, and that, What does that do for civil rights for LBGP? Yeah. This, is, this is a huge issue, and in fact, there were um, uh, friend of the court briefs filed in the, in, uh, the same-sex marriage cases by individuals, uh, other scholars, opposed to same-sex marriage that actually cited my own work to, as evidence that you know, LGBT individuals didn't constitute a discrete group that, that warranted uh, equal protection status because sexuality was so fluid. So How no did one you was feel being about discriminated. That? I was rather distressed by it, as you might imagine. Uh, and I had the chance to you know, file briefs saying that I disagreed with that point of view. But when it came down to it, uh, the, the sort of fixedness, the immutability of sexual orientation, this notion that, oh, we deserve these rights because we're born this way, that has actually not played 
really any significant role in any of the judicial rulings on the rights of LGBT individuals for quite some time. Uh, courts have basically said it's not the immutability of a trait that matters. It's whether laws forbidding certain conduct are motivated by hatred or, or animus. Uh, and so we really don't need to argue that we're born a certain way and that we're fixed and that we're you know, permanently channeled um, in order to advocate for civil rights. And what I've always you know, said to this is it doesn't matter how or why you came to want to have sex with a certain type of person or marry them. Either we're a society that protects your sexual freedom and your liberty to choose your marital partner, or we're not. And you have to make the de decision on that basis. Lisa, thank you. Thank you. Lisa Diamond is a professor of psychology and gender studies at the University of Utah, and you can read more about her research in her book, Sexual Fluidity, Understanding Women's Love and Desire.